Welcome to the SEG Europe Regional Advisory Committee's webinar series, State of the Energy Industry. Dr. Adriana Ramirez, Chair of the Europe uh, Regional Advisory Committee, and Aurelian Rosia, who will be uh, Chair in a few months, uh, have joined us. And uh, we will be serving as your hosts for today's webinar. Before we begin, the model for this webinar will be a short presentation followed by an extended question and answer session. During uh, the question and answer session, if you'd like to ask your questions, please place them in the question and answer box. It's labeled Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So today's presenter, Pierre Evind Delhi, received a civil engineering degree in petroleum geology and geophysics from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in 1998. He started working with seismic image processing with both offshore and onshore data for Fugro. A few years ago, a few years later, he moved to PGS and continued his focus on seismic processing with special emphasis on demultiples and seismic interference. In 2007, he took over the role as global manager for the geophysical support team stationed in Houston. In 2010, he became Chief Geophysicist for PGS Multi-Client. Three years later, with more than 15 years in the seismic contractor business, he left PGS and started working for London, Norway, and Oslo. He primarily, his primary interest is broadband seismic and 4D, as well as seismic source development. He is an active and contributing member of SEG and EAGE. Without further ado, let's please welcome Peer event. Welcome. Thank you very much for that uh, nice introduction. Uh, it sounds like I'm uh, very old, so I pretend I'm not that old yet. Um, the, the title of my talk today is um, Virtual Management and Seismic Exploration During a Pandemic. And uh, before I begin, I must say that I think the title is really true. This is what we are going to talk about. And um, maybe not so many people have had a similar title before because uh, I don't think many people have had the pleasure to, to perform uh, seismic exploration during a pandemic. So, so um, I think we can just uh, hope that this pandemic is, is uh, soon over and that there won't be many similar talks <laughs> later. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll show you that um, we had plans and we had to manage those plans, even though uh, we had a serious uh, problem during it. So um, before I start on my sort of real presentation, I need to say a few words about uh, who we are in Lundin Energy Norway. Um, at the moment, we are around 400 employees of the company. Uh, we have 160,000 barrels of oil production per day. The company was uh, founded in 2004 and um, the first license we were uh, given uh, was um, uh, license 338 where the Edvard Grieg, Grieg discovery was made in 2007. Three years later, uh, we found the Johan Sverdrup field, which is the largest uh, producing field in Norway now. Um, and uh, along with those two, we also have Alvheim area, which has been a, um, a nice uh, producing uh, field area for us for, for quite a few years. We are focused on organic growth and we are active on the whole Norwegian continental shelf. We do not uh, explore outside of Norway. And we are also very active in the Barents Sea and working hard there to try and bring some of our discoveries, uh, Alta Gotha, to name a few of them, uh, into a PDO and, and produce them. Uh, this year we are drilling seven exploration wells, so we are very active. In terms of our production guidance, um, as I said, prior to 2015, when Edward Grieg came on stream, we had relatively small production from the Alheim area. And at once Edward Grieg came on stream, 
we jumped up to 60,000 barrels a day and gradually increased to around 80,000, where we have stayed the last three years until Johan Sverdrup came on stream last year. And we are now up at around 160,000 barrels of oil per day. We aim to increase that to uh, at least uh, 200,000 barrels of oil by 2024 by bringing some of our contingent resources into reserves and starting to produce them. Uh, for uh, what we are working on now is uh, we are planning to do infill drilling on the Edward Green field in 2021. And we, we are going to bring the Solvay field on production in Q3 next year. And we are uh, the most active exploration company in Norway. Uh, new projects we are targeting uh, around 120 million barrels of oil uh, to be, that we are trying to work on, on now that we have in the pipeline. Um, we are amongst the industry's um, lowest operating costs. Uh, we have around three, four dollars uh, of oper operating cost per barrel and our carbon emissions are also extremely, extremely low. Um, in terms of um, this carbon emission, um, I think that it's fair to say that we are a secure energy provider and as such we are part of the energy transition. Uh, I mentioned that we have uh, around 4 kilograms of CO2 per barrel of oil produced, that's now in 2020. The industry average is around 18 and Norway is down at around 8. But our fields are exceptionally low and we are, uh, have excellent um, fields in production. So we are around 4 kilograms of CO2 per barrel of oil produced. Our aim is to com become completely carbon neutral by 2030. We stated this goal quite uh, some time ago now and others have followed suit on, on this uh, term. How are we going to get there? Well, electrification of the platforms is one of the items. You can see the electric power cable that is going to be connected between shore and the Edward Grieg platform is being produced these days. This is taken in the, in the factory a couple of weeks ago. It's also a matter of maximizing the use of existing infrastructure in terms of increased oil recovery and also enhanced oil recovery and 4D seismic to get as mo much of uh, oil out of the ground in those assets that are already there. It's like, you know, not trading in your iPhone now, but actually using it longer, the same with cars and stuff. And that is going to reduce your, your footprint or your carbon footprint by using things that are, have been built at a longer time. We are also uh, investing in renewables. Um, last year we, we purchased ourselves into or put money into a hydro and also a wind power plant to offset our energy consumption. I'm going to talk uh, quite a lot about the Edward Greenfield because that's where we acquired this for the seismic uh, this year. And as I said, this was discovered in September 2007 and uh, the plan for development and operation was approved in June 2012. And first oil was November 2015. Um, the reservoir is supported in terms of pressure by water injection that started uh, a couple of months after we started the oil production. Um, in terms of 4D seismic, uh, the first proper baseline survey was acquired in the summer of 2016. So around seven, eight months after first oil. Uh, we have 10 oil production wells on stream now and four injectors are injecting water to maintain the pressure. We had our first repeat for the OBC in the summer of 2018, very successfully acquired and with very good results. 
and we decided in late 2019 to acquire a second repeat uh, in 2020. And this is the survey that I'm going to address during that happened during the pandemic. Um, currently, we have around 300 million barrels of 2P reserve. Uh, the recovery factor of the field has increased now to around 55. I think it was 35 around the PBO. So we have quite a high recovery factor already. And this is what we aim to push further with our 4D uh, monitoring surveys. We have an infill program that is being finalized now for three to four wells in 2020. And this is one of the reasons why it was crucial for us to get a picture of the reservoir to, in order to position these uh, three to four infill wells. We have now planned uh, the next OBC survey for 2022, based on the fact that what we acquired this year and the last uh, two surveys before that is super nice, high quality 4D data. So we have decided that this adds so much value to us that we want to continue uh, monitoring uh, the reservoir. So um, here you see a few photographs that we took during uh, this uh, survey. Uh, we mobilized around um, April 1st, the end of March and uh, we acquired data for approximately uh, so say april and may we, we had the data in, in um, around the end of may here so um what about seismic 4d acquisition during a pandemic so only three weeks prior to our mobilization the world basically came to a standstill so there was a full lockdown in most of all the European countries. So we were sitting here discussing sort of how are we going to mobilize four large seismic vessels, two support vessels, 105 crew members from more than 20 different countries and nationalities around the world when people are basically not allowed to travel. How are we going to perform the final vessel inspections? How are we going to do the HSC meetings, the project startup meetings? Do we have to reduce the amount of people offshore? And what about a backup plan if crews are not able to arrive to the port? Or if, in fact, the vessel isn't allowed to go into that port when it comes there? And what about COVID-19 as uh, you know, a virus and people becoming sick from this? We need to have mitigations and plans and what ifs here. So there was a lot of things that suddenly came onto our plate that we had no idea and no you know, real reason to see it was, it was coming to us. So, but before that, I wanted to sort of address a little bit why do you want to bother with 4D seismic? Because in this problematic situation, you could sort of just cancel the whole thing if it's not critical to do it. So this uh, picture is basically a sort of a model where we have, um, where we're showing the Edward Green platform standing on the seafloor in 110 meters of water. And we have uh, all the well paths displayed here in a one-to-one -one scale and the city that you're see, seeing underneath there is uh, the city of Oslo uh, where I am sitting now. Uh, our office is actually right here by the by the Lysake river coming out here and uh, the city is centering Oslo with the train station is just over here the castle is here and I'm at home now so I'm just up here but anyway, um, the field is around six by six uh, kilometers in distance. And there, here you see all the well paths. So I've marked the ones here in blue. These are the, the, the oil production wells where we are um, draining out oil or, or pumping out oil. So the point is here, can we actually see that in our seismic images? And on the west side of the uh, field, we are uh, in injecting water in four water injectors 
And then can we see where the water is being injected and how it flows into our reservoir? Next year, we are planning to drill, as I said, three to five new infill wells. And then the question is, where exactly should we place, uh, should we inject water? And where should we place the new oil production wells to get the best production and also find targets or sweet spots that we are not producing from today? So you can say that 4D seismic is a reservoir monitoring tool, and you can observe what's happening down in the reservoir and react based on real observations. This allows us to increase the recovery factor of the field substantially. And I think that historically, we can easily claim that we can see an increased recovery factor of around 10%. For our case, that means an additional 30 to 50 million barrels of oil. If you assume a price of around 50, that's 1.5 to 2.5 billion dollars. So there is a real good economy behind doing this sort of monitoring and trying to recover, gain a higher recovery factor on your field. So I think that what I've said now is really no surprise. I think this you can look up in any book on 4D. But I think that I must emphasize one thing, and that is you have to be able to act on the 4D result. And time is of the essence here. And when I mean time here, that is the time from the 4D seismic is taken. Actually, the boats are out there acquiring the seismic till you can deliver the results of that seismic experiment into the reservoir team, in the interpretation, in the office, and impacts can actually be made on the well paths. And we are wanting to here, you know, talk about days. We want to be out there, shoot the seismic, and deliver that image to the reservoir team in, you know, less than a week or two weeks. We're not talking about half a year of processing here. It needs to be fresh when we deliver the data to bring value. And also, you need to be able to act on that uh, information and we are excellently positioned now that we are going to drill and have this infill campaign uh, early next year. So then, boom, three weeks before that, we were hit by COVID-19. We were all at home and nobody were allowed to travel. What do we do now? So I call this seismic 40 acquisition during a pandemic. We had to sort of come up with lots of ideas on all the stuff that we had outstanding to perform here prior to, to starting the survey. So one of the things we did, we, we had to do uh, perform desktop reviews. Uh, auditors were not allowed to travel between the countries and inspect the vessel. So we sent the crew out with phones and GoPro cameras and then set up an FTP site and told them to go through the whole vessel, every single room, all the uh, PPE gear, all the life-saving equipment, and film all these um, inspection tags and all the equipment so we could have our auditors look at this on video from our office and basically be, be, um, perform desktop reviews instead of actually traveling there and looking uh, for themselves. We had to do lots of team meetings, Zoom meetings, etc., for all, for all the HSC meetings and the startup meetings. And vessel visits was basically out of the question. Um, another thing is that um, we had to keep several mob forge open for various locations around the North Sea region because we were not sure if the different governments, either in Denmark, the UK, or Norway, or Netherlands for that matter, would simply close their ports and not allow any vessels in. And you know, when you start up a project, there's lots of spare parts and food and supplies coming. So you have to sort of double back up on where do you think it's most likely that we are able to go to port and where should we bring all the equipment and we need a backup plan to ship everything from one country to another country 
via trucks if in worst case the vessel cannot go into that port. And the same for uh, people. We are having to tell people where to travel to go on board the vessels, but we're not 100% sure where they are allowed to board the vessel. This is the same for offshore refueling, which we uh, are not so happy about because spills could quite easily happen. So you have to work with that as well when you have no other option. We had lots of equipment coming in from other places that were delayed and uh, we actually had to uh, ransom a lot of warehouses around in Europe for various equipment that we needed during this OBC campaign that simply uh, did not arrive for us to use it at all. You're seeing a video there, and this is uh, from one of the videos uh, inspecting the source arrays on board the, the shooting vessel. So I, I probably have around uh, 20 videos from the four vessels we used there with these inspections. So we kind of had a, a, a movie night at the office where we sat down with uh, Coke and, and uh, chips and watched these, uh, these uh, movies and made notes and sent feedback uh, uh, to the vessels. In terms of um, kicking off the project itself, um, we had all these video conferences and phone conferences for all the meetings, the project meetings, technical meetings, HSC. We had with each of the various uh, instrumentation rooms on board, the gun mechanics, the navigators, etc., etc. We also decided that we had to reduce the offshore staffing as much as we possibly could. There isn't that many people you can take off when you have four vessels and each of, two of them have around 35 to 40 people and the two others only have seven, eight people. So, so, so um, we were able to reduce uh, our uh, headcount offshore with around 5% by installing uh, computers um, uh, that uh, logged a lot of things and sent that directly into the cloud. So we had softwares installed on our machines at home and in the office and even on our mobile phones. So we could track the operation 24 seven from onshore. We also reduced some double shift arrangement offshore. Um, and one of the things that we suffered from there was that we actually had two vessels capable of laying cable, but because of reduced amount of people, only one of them could perform that operation. We did not, we did not, have, not have enough uh, people on the back deck on one of the vessels. Also, we had, or I would say we allowed carpooling to some of the mob ports. So we told people, uh, for instance, in the south of England, to drive all the way up to Aberdeen, uh, carpooling instead of, of um, or to, to avoid the congested airports and, and train stations. So we actually did get COVID-19 on board. So we had to manage that. We went through uh, the, the plans on the, or the mitigations plans and everything prior to, um, to the survey and with all the people in the HSC meetings. But uh, one of the guys actually uh, probably uh, brought the virus with him from one of the airports prior to uh, getting on one of the vessels. Uh, I must uh, thank and, and you know big, give a big hands to the crew on this job um, operated by Shearwater that they actually managed to put him in uh, um, an area on the vessel by himself and have him uh, locked out for the rest of the crew and we did not, he did not infect any of the other people on the vessel. He was taken off the vessel after a couple of days and sent into uh, to shore in Stavanger. We had our procedures to follow there, but when the vessel came into Stavanger, the police said, no, 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 uh, you are not a Norwegian vessel. You are not allowed to go into shore. So we had to negotiate with the police and with the hospitals and with the different departments, both from the contractor side and from our side. And after three days of discussions, 
uh, the person was finally allowed to sort of take the vessel from anchor and into port and being met by people from the hospital to test him and then bring him on to a, um, a quarantine uh, hotel in Stavanger set up for, for this purpose. After a couple of days, he got well again and he was released from uh, the quarantine and he was actually taken on board the vessel and could continue uh, as a, uh, his work on board the vessel. So I think that uh, we had our fair share of, of issues, but uh, we managed it really well. And we were a team of people working sort of day and night and communicating with teams and all the tools we had and mobile phones, of course and able to sort out and address the various items that came up all the time. I, I'm going to say now or, or in, um, tell you that we managed to do an ultra fast 4D uh, delivery on this survey. And I think that that is attributed a lot to digitalization. So for onboard vessels, we uh, perform for fast automated onboard QC. So we had these computers installed offshore and we had uh, the same software both onshore and offshore. And this allowed us to look at problem lines and, and agree if reissues were needed or not, such that we could actually ship the recorded data of the acquisition vessel the same day it was acquired. So we said that we batched up, you know, maybe six, seven days of acquired data. And when that last day was, um, we, we came to that last day, we said, okay, tomorrow, all the recorded data needs to be sent off the vessel with one of our support vessels and into shore and being immediately packed by DHL and sent to the processing center. And I would say normally it takes uh, probably three, four days of QC navigation merging, first bay freaking and all this before you, are, you can do that. So you need to have trained, qualified, good people and a lot of practice if you're going to be able to ship the data off the vessel more or less the same day you require it. But we managed to do that. In terms of processing the data after the data was uh, arrived in the processing center, uh, we were using uh, Best Angico in the UK to process this 40 data. And uh, we had, in advance of acquisition, we spent uh, three, four months where we actually predefined the whole processing flow and we run everything in advance of acquisition, uh, acquiring the data. And the way that was done was by making a copy of the data that we had from before and just sort of naming that as 2020 data and running a whole 4D processing flow with 20, uh, 20 data that was acquired two years earlier. And once we got each of the receiver data into the processing center, we could swap out receiver station or receiver lines by receiver lines by receiver line, and then just simply hit run. And in about uh, one to two days, the whole 4D migrated results came out with new file names. So, so that was a, a neat trick that um, probably most uh, processing companies can perform quite easily, but that really made a difference to us that, that we simply swap the old data for the new data and, and rerun all the flows. We also had predefined 4D attributes. So when immediately as the jobs were finished, creating the 16, the 18 and the 20 data sets, and also generating the difference cube between those three volumes, we had predefined actually 43 different 4D seismic attributes based on input from uh, seismic processors, from the reservoir people and the people interpreting the seismic data. And this uh, attribute generation was actually the first one coming out even prior to the SegY generation. 
So I think that's fair to say that despite COVID-19, we really did it on this survey. So we had split the survey acquisition into two patches. You can see here that we had a gap in the middle here. This was left out because of high playing to the Solvay field. I mentioned in the start of the presentation that we are bringing the Solvay field into production next year. And there are pipelines going from the field 20 kilometers south and into the Edward Grieg platform, which will act as the, the producing hub for the Solvay field. So um, the 4D results for this patch B here was delivered eight days after the tapes came into the processing center. And for um, our patch A on this side, uh, the same speed was achieved. We delivered it actually only seven days after, and that was for the whole uh, area. And when I say 4D results, I mean all the 43 attributes with the whole data set and both 16, 18, and 20, and all the different cube were available seven days after tape delivery and FTP'd across from UK to us that same day. And I believe this is a world record. Nobody has been able to do it this fast, especially, I mean, this is not a permanent system. This is laying the cables down, taking them up again when you are finished. And I think that there are a lot of reasons in addition to sort of the practicalities of this, but it has a lot to do with trust-based uh, leadership. Um, the ability to do what needs to be done and also working in an agile and lean organization able to lead projects in constant change. We had extremely short lines of communication so that everybody knows who makes decisions on what. And we have had sort of several times during every uh, um, evening, we had uh, larger discussions uh, in the teams to, to sort out uh, the pipeline, where we're going to, what's happening to the processing, etc. And also it requires people with the ability to make decisions, so empowered employees. And I think that we have also learned a lot from the past, but it's also about applying that to the future. So I think that in this survey, I also have other examples, like we had actually over 30 summer students uh, working for us this summer, despite a lot of companies canceled all their summer jobs because you were not allowed to um, bring people in and you were not allowed to you know, have uh, people travel, etc. So we decided, no, we think that it's important to, to show to young uh, people probably coming into our industry in a couple of years that, uh, that we are able to adapt to these uh, very difficult circumstances and allow them to, to do their, their summer job as, as normal. Also, uh, some of us actually did travel to the vessel mob ports, despite not being allowed on board any of the vessel. And I was there in one of our mobilization ports, standing behind the fence, looking at the vessel 50 meters away, and not being allowed to talk to any of the crew or see them or do anything. But it sort of it makes you feel that you are in the project, you, you, just 50 meters away from where you would be if it, everything was normal. But you get that different feeling of actually being, being there. So I think that when people put their hearts and minds into something greater than themselves, good things can happen here. I wanted to share with you a little bit of the fast track interpretation that was done um, three, four days after the data was received at end of May. So this slide was probably made on June the 4th or something. And it's Jung, uh, one of the guys working on, on the field. Um, he's an interpreter and he, he does most of the 4D interpretation here. And um, this here is the, the old 4D results we had from 2016 to 2018, where the water injectors are injecting water out here. And you see that this is flood, flooding towards the production side over here. You also see um, um, 
the water uh, or the oil production from the three first oil producing wells over here. And when we acquired the uh, 20 data and compare that to the 18, you see how the waterfront continues to move towards the oil producing side uh, of, of the field here. Um, we see a new waterfront coming up from water injector number four. This was the last one to come on stream. And we also see uh, water injection from the A5 well. These three water injections were drilled initially, but this one did not work. We actually were not able to inject anything at all because there was something wrong in this well. So this was um, uh, reworked and we opened it up again and started injecting water. And we had much, much higher pressure initially. And you can see that here in the 4D signal. This strong blue blob is testament to, to very high pressure in, around this injector. We also see potential water rising around some of the, of the, um, of the um, production wells here. Um, in these blobs here, we think is gas produced. So um, the first uh, part uh, from the oil um, field came on stream until we acquired the data in 2016. Um, we drew down the pressure so much because we didn't start water injection early. So, so we produced gas out of solution and this was later produced out of the reservoir. We of course monitor what, uh, what's coming up through the various wells and we actually produce gas here. So we think that this was present when we acquired the data in 16 and was later produced out before 18. We see now that we don't seem to have any significant water production here and we also seem to have stabilized the, the gas situation on this side of the field here. In terms of that pressure effect around the A5, you see the pressures are plotted here for the various water injectors. And you see that our A5 well has a very, very high injected pressure between the 18 to the 20 survey. And you see that very, very strong blue blob uh, testament to that high pressure effect. So what are we using that interpretation for now? Well, the prior to the uh, 20 survey, we uh, had lots of different infill targets uh, that we were going to, uh, to aim for in this infill campaign that was actually planned in this autumn, but has been delayed a little bit. And you see now with the new 4D seismic that some of these targets are no longer applicable. We are injecting water into this one here, and the same with this one between these two um, areas that we detected in 2018. This is probably not a, uh, no longer a good spot to, to, to put um, um, either an injector or a producer, but some of them are still, of course, uh, good. So in terms of, was it worth it as, as, as a business case here? So I have made three very simple business cases for 4D on the Edward Brig here. The first one is if we simply assume that we are able to increase the recovery factor by approximately 10%. Uh, for our field, that would mean an additional 30 million barrels of oil. If you multiply that by roughly $50, about 40 today maybe, that's actually $1,500 million or $1.5 billion. So if we do 15 4D surveys, so if we could keep on doing 4D surveys every two years for, the, for 30 years, we will have spent around $225 million and we have gained, we have gotten paid $1,500 million for that in value. So that is a really simple and easy case. A second case is if we place one infill well in the wrong place for one survey. So if we just simply say that for the infill campaign that we are going to do now, if we place 
um, if we if we are able to place one infill well in the right place instead of the wrong place and save one infill well, the survey costed us around 15 million. And one infill well is more than twice that price. So you saw on the map that we could quite easily have picked an infill place where we're, or an injector position where we were already injecting water and that well would have been completely wasted. A third case is if you say that we are able to find one infill target with the seismic that we otherwise wouldn't be able to find. So I put up two scenarios there. If you find six um, million barrels of oil in that target, multiplied by five, that's $300 million. Or if you find a small target of only 1 million barrel of oil, that's $50 million. And the cost of the seismic is around 15 million again. So there's a very healthy business case if you are also or able to find one infill target um, for the survey that you are performing. These are sort of back of the envelope type of simple business cases. These are not NPVs or anything like this. It's just simple and very, uh, and they are quite realistic as well. It's not that easy to make the case much more um, uh, or, or see into the future to much greater detail than, than you can do here. So um, back to uh, the COVID-19 situation and keeping up the activity level. So. I think that this is a, a main obstacle for not just the, the seismic industry or the oil and gas industry, but it's also, you know, for any other type of industry now in this uh, pandemic situation. But the Norwegian government um, came quite early up with a stimulus package, uh, which was presented to all the EMP companies on the Norwegian continental shelf in June uh, 2020. It's basically a temporary tax chain, uh, change uh, to retain the activity level in the supply industry. So it's not really for the oil and gas company to, to be working, but it, but it is for uh, you know, the, the, all the shipbuilding yards and etc. those people building platforms and the subsea infrastructure to actually have a job. If every company just shuts down all their activity, there will be hundreds of thousands of people unemployed in Norway very, very, very quick. So this was approved by the parliament in Norway in June. And it basically uh, encouraged the EMP companies to submit a plan for development and operations by the end of 2022. And this was done by tax incentives so we have less current tax in 2020 and 2021. And that um, uh, tax means an increased tax installment for, for later. So it's not reduced. It just means that we don't pay it now, but we pay it later. It, it's, a, it's a healthy uh, benefit on the NPV or quite, uh, or quite a few projects. So uh, we have made our kind of a short list that we are working very hard on now. Uh, the Rolls-Ness extended well test and Solvay phase two as phase one is being developed now. Um, Evra Eving, we are trying to make a case for Alta Gota now and, and some other projects that we are working on as, on as well. And I think that same type of lists exists in all the other 50, 67 uh, oil companies on the Norwegian continental shelf, trying to use the benefit of, of this um, uh, temporary tax change to stimulate uh, companies to, to, to continue working. Um, I also need to mention and draw your attention to what I would like to call digitalization by COVID-19. And I think it's fair to say that the whole world suddenly woke up to a new and changed world in mid-March. Uh, Norway was officially shut down in a press conference by our Prime Minister on March the 12th. 
I was at work that day and we were called into a large team meeting where our uh, reservoir director or exploration director said that uh, tomorrow you're not basically allowed to come in the office. So take all your equipment home and set up and, and, and try to work as normal from eight to four, uh, basically from your own house. And um, so we did. And I think that uh, the rest of the Norway also had to do this. So digital solutions became sort of the everyday life for kids, for parents, for the family, for the grandparents and for everybody. And um, I believe that we could say that the COVID-19 pandemic could in many ways be seen as one of the key drivers who helped us to go full digital and full virtual. And um, I think for our business, uh, the change happened really from one day to the next. It's fair to say that we are a modern industry, of course, and all the tools, they were actually there already, but we probably did not use them very a lot until we were forced to actually use them. And um, I had used Zoom before and I had used Team before and Skype, but not like for the, for the whole group of 70, 80 people and for even for the whole company, 350 to 400 people logging in and to, to, to see our CEO, you know, in a round table discussion on, on what are we going to do during the COVID, etc. So I think that we will keep pushing for more digitalization offshore, so left staff on the rigs, etc. And I think that our appetite to go virtual and digital has indeed uh, risen. Um, and in terms of digital meetings, we have been uh, trained, you know, by force <laughs> in the use of all these new tools, uh, Teams, Skype, GoToMeeting, Zoom, Floor, I learned uh, a few weeks ago, Blue Jeans, uh, to name some of them. But I think that we have also learned to appreciate the value of meeting people face to face. A real interaction between physical people adds value beyond uh, what digital solutions can offer. And I took this picture here, one of our guys smelling uh, the core samples. And uh, I, yet, I yet have to see that happening in the, in the virtual world. So, so this is actually a, one of, a relatively large problem for us uh, to, to go and see the cores that we are drilling now. Um, they are brought into Stavanger, most of them. And uh, we are not allowed to go there or stay over. And, uh, and so, so that is uh, something we are, we are struggling with uh, for real. I wanted to cover a little bit on machine learning as well and artificial intelligence. And um, I think that uh, the oil and gas industry has recently become a real fast mover in these topics now. Uh, new processing tools are being transitioned and developed into machine uh, learning algorithms every week now. And I think that I also see that the new generation of oil and gas staff, so younger people you know, below 30 years now, they have now gained enough experience uh, the last uh, three, four years in working for our companies and adapting and knowing machine learning and Python scripting and, and things like that. So I think that we can expect this technology to really leap forwards in our industry and affect every aspect of it the next few years. Um, um, a lot of people and myself as well is really motivated to reduce the turnaround time for seismic image and processing project from today's six to 12 months down to something like one to three months. For our 4D project, we were able to turn it around in less than 10 days. But um, if we are going to do that even faster, I think that we have to employ more digitalization. We have to allow compression and we have to transfer the data via a satellite instead of having to write it out to, to disks, put them in a box, get it onto a support vessel, save to Aberdeen or into Stavanger, give it to DHL truck, put it on an airplane, send it to London, 
take it out via DHL, truck it to the processing center and read the tapes in. If we can narrow that down to maybe six, seven, 10 hours FTP from the vessel, we will save another three, four days on this turnaround, which I think will be really, really cool. Back to the machine learning and artificial intelligence. I think we will see that we'll start off with economically attractive items first. I like to say that sometimes the boring and labor intensive stuff. From our side, um, uh, we see in the Lundin exploration, the real uptake is so far in the processing side on denoising, demultiple, frequency enhancement, uh, et cetera, et cetera, spectral balancing um, and uh, post stack noise, denoising, things like that, uh, that relates to maybe image processing but we are starting to get really, really advanced in this now. And more and more often, we are going after this on, on the gather level before stack. In terms of the bigger picture later, I think that uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence does stand a chance to attack this inherent, the, the, the big uh, cake in, that, that can be extract the earth properties and geological phases directly from the seismic data. So combine all the well log information, all the, the core samples, all the stratigraphy information, all the interpretation, all the spectral decomposition with FWI, velocity models, elastic inversion, and your raw input data, and take all that and output the, the earth properties. We're not there yet. Some people don't believe we can get there, but I, I think that um, someday we will see that happen and probably earlier than most of us um, or old people believe. I have to also talk a little bit about uh, the state of the seismic acquisition industry, which is close uh, to me in, in my line of work every day, working on all the acquisition projects we do in in Lundin Energy. And I think that it's fair to say that the seismic acquisition companies were just about to see a positive trend going into 2019. And uh, for the first time in a very long time, they were reporting that uh, prices and interest and tender activity were all going. Suddenly, uh, the pandemic uh, hit us. And I think that. Uh, <laughs> Well, the rest is history now. And the problems in the seismic industry and the cut in budget and everything. But Lundin sees seismic acquisition and new data as a key enabler to successfully explore for hydrocarbon. It is the de facto most important tool we have and we will continue to acquire new seismic with new technology and new methods for even improved imaging quality. That's out of the question. If we're going to continue to explore, we need uh, seismic data. Um, I think that um, I'd like to call this last slide Explorers by Nature. There is indeed a future in the E and P business. Um, Exploration is critical for the future and it is part of the secure energy solution going forward. The IAA, Faitib uh, Vitol, stated this very clearly. He has a lot of presentations online lately where he says that um, oil and gas is going to be part of the solution for the next decade, maybe even beyond 20, 30 years. But we definitely have a position in there and doing that as environmentally friendly as possible is, is an important job for us. According to the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate, the Norwegian continental shelf still holds around 4 billion standard cubic meters of oil and gas resources yet to be found. They are a lot more tricky now to find than they used to be, and it requires new technology. It requires us to push on bringing machine learning, artificial intelligence, new acquisition methods, improvements basically everywhere. The prices of oil and energy, I think is assumed to be lower now, 
the BP report came out stating that the IAA report assumes that the energy prices will be lower on average than they assumed a year ago. So you have to be a lot smarter and discover and develop cheaper fields. And this is going to be a joint effort in terms of exploration, development, upstream, downstream, and also the supply industry. We are all going to rely on each other developing technology here. So I think that for the oil companies, we have a job to do in supporting, uh, from my side, especially the seismic industry in their continued technology uh, development effort. If not, we are not going to be able to deliver on, on, on what we have to do. I also want to say that uh, things do take time and it actually does. So, so from a discovery is made to hydrocarbons is actually produced and sold. It can take anywhere from five to 10 years. It's probably more likely 10 years than five. I have almost never heard of five. So, so the government needs to provide secure, stable and sustainable fiscal regimes to operate on a long-term basis. And I think they're very aware of it. They were early on with this tax incentive. So, so the Norwegian government is definitely doing their job uh, on this uh, side. And I know that uh, the OGA in, in, um, in the UK recently offered an 113 licenses in the latest uh, round uh, in early September now. So they're also uh, actively on this ball to, to, to keep um, um, secure energy available um, in an environmentally friend, friendly manner. So I think that is what I had planned for today. And I hope that uh, people are still online and that we can have uh, some uh, discussions. All right, thank you. Very, very good presentation. Thank you for having. I, I, have, I have one question. Uh, I mean, you already touched a, a little bit upon it, but in terms of offshore uh, efficiencies or learnings from this uh, experience that you had, what do you think that can be more important in the future? I, I'm just wondering, for example, we do a lot of vessel inspections and we, we usually travel there and want to see the equipment and want to talk to the people and that's very important especially to highlight to the persons how important they are uh, for, the, for the whole project and the, the agency part. But is it really necessary to be there in person? That's one of the questions that I have. I, I really do think that it is necessary. Um, I think that the, uh, a lot of the reasons why we were able to do this project as successfully as we did here uh, was that we had really really good relationships with all the people i guess i mean not each individual crew member of course but we had worked with uh, the captain on the vessel before we had worked with the, the fishery reps we had worked with the qc reps before we we had um, you know, monthly visits to the processing um, uh, people in uh, the Gatwick Center of West Angico. We had been uh, probably five, six times to the Shearwater headquarters in Bergen before the, the pandemic uh, hit us. So, so we knew all the people. It was just a matter of, you know, flip up the phone, ring them, and then they could start talking about the problems and the issues or the plans for the next day, what's happening. Uh, and, and I think that is not possible if you haven't really met these people before. So, so we had an advantage that is not gonna last forever when you are not meeting people now. So as soon as we are able to travel again, we need to pick up on that, start meeting the teams again and build up that trust and relationship uh, which is really, really valuable uh, in these kind of circumstances. I would also like to say that uh, because of the kind of uh, lower prices in the seismic industry, there is also more people with 
different uh, varied background on the vessels. We had, I think, 23 different nationalities. And, and uh, that is also a, a challenge that you need to manage the language and everything like that. So, so um, I think it is quite important to, 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 to take the advantage of, of meeting them, not necessarily on the vessel itself, but in port or in the hotel or in the airport prior to them, them getting to their, to their assigned uh, ports. Yeah, no, I understand and I don't disagree with you. I'm just wondering if there's something that we can implement or learn from this experience uh, to reduce either traveling or something and make, while still maintaining the quality and the HSC expectations that we, we, we have and the standards. Um, another question that I, that I, I mean, we can discuss in, in this topic is the industry, as you touched upon at the end of your presentation, has, has suffered a lot in this, in, this, in this time. And it's interesting that you kept all your students uh, for, for this season. But as you know, a lot of companies have been reducing more and more personnel. That is likely to create a, a gap. We have had five years more or less of a downturn with a lot of reductions. A lot of the young people ha have left uh, the industry. And we also have uh, the more senior people leaving. How is, how is Lundin going to, to work through this possible gap? Or is, or is, it, is that not something that you are experiencing in your company? Generational. Well, I think that first of all, I would, yeah, I think that first of all, um, we, I, I feel that we are not experiencing that so much in, in Lundin Energy in Norway. Uh, we have uh, taken on board um, probably 30, 40 new staff last year. Um, of course, uh, the company was founded in 2004, so we are starting to see uh, quite a few of the uh, sort of the, the generation that came on board early on in 2005, 2006, they have now been there close to 15 years. The, a lot of them are uh, close to retirement age now and are, are actually retiring and because they want to. Uh, and so, so, uh, so I think that uh, we're probably seeing around 10, I, I don't know these numbers for, but, uh, but you know, just for knowing people, there's at least more than five every year now retiring and, and we, have, we are taking on board. I think last year we were, 380 now we are 405 or eight or something today so, so um, uh, if all the oil and gas companies were doing like we do that I don't think we would have a problem but I, I'm worried about it I mean I have all my friends in, in, the, in the, the seismic companies in Oslo um, they are you know almost not there anymore it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit sad so I am a, a I'm afraid about that worries me and it also worries me that uh, it will be challenging uh, for our industry um, to, to attract uh, the great uh, young minds as well but um, I think we are we are aware of this issue and we are doing all we can to mitigate it uh, as we said, keeping our summer students this year, despite a lot of companies uh, sort of took that one out first uh, and foremost, uh, we decided that was a, a critical one. I mean, you could send home all the employees, but let the summer students be in the office alone, uh, to put it uh, a little bit on the edge, but uh, that, that's, that's what happened. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience, Laurie or Aurelian? Um, yeah, I have a question. So you asked the question, was it worth it? And you presented quite interesting numbers from an economical point of view. But um, what, what was the feedback from your team, from the people involved? So was this a special effort that you achieved those quite promising results in, in an efficient way um, so that you could transfer this, this 
um, this this kind of work to to every future, any other future project, or was this a special effort by all the people involved? Like did did, uh, did oh, the I think people, so are they are they happy to to work in these circumstances apart from travel restrictions, or was this especially challenging for people? And they say like they would be happy in if in the future everything went back to to normal. I think that we have learned also to appreciate the value of um, of online meetings um, uh, and uh, between the vessels because it's not that normal to have startup meetings uh, virtual and uh, not sitting maybe in an office, people calling in from from everywhere. But now it became sort of the this is what you have to do. There is no other option. So so of course people have gradually become. Um, better at sharing the screens and sharing documents and sending things up front and and um, uh, you know calling up people on their iPhones with uh, several people at the same time and, and making things effective in that manner so I think that we have also uh, gained uh, from um, from the situation in, in that respect and so so that will stay with us I, I believe that uh, uh, in terms of the uh, was it worth it? Um, we did not promise to deliver this data in less than 10 days. <laughs> I think we said something around a month. So uh, the rest of our team was, uh, you know, they were quite shocked when uh, when we sent them or when I sent them the email with uh, now all the 40 is finished. And here is here are the results, you know. 10 days after we finished the survey. So uh, so, so that was, uh, I mean, the vessels hadn't uh, arrived into port. We sent the tapes off a lot earlier and then they had to pull up the cables and do lots of other stuff. And then they sailed to, to Holland. So so um, we had the results before the, the most of the crew had left the vessels. So we shared it with them as well. Here you see the result of your work. Uh, I don't think that has ever happened to them. So. So the, a lot of people were extremely impressed by what we were able to do uh, here. Um, we have a question, especially regarding younger folks. Is there anything that you recommend to emerging professionals or to students in attendance or watching the video, how they can better um, comply with these new um, situations regarding AI, machine learning, um, digitalization? How they can better prepare to still be a part of the exploration and production industry in the future. Well, that's a that's a that's a good question, and um, and uh, of course I know people uh, in the university myself these days, and and, uh, and we have presentation for students. So, so yeah, I think that uh, that um, uh, that uh, you know take an interest in the in the question of energy. Uh, and uh, and uh, and also sort of listen to some of these webcasts by 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 IAE for instance and, and engage in in that that problem of making sort of all the energy we come from from green supplies and and um, because then I think that people will have a um, easier adaptation to understanding their own picture in in uh, where can you help. To, to, to solve that problem. So doing things faster, more efficiently is also going to reduce the footprint and making the technology more versatile, uh, making it easier to use, etc. That is also saving time and money and ultimately energy. Uh, so so, so um, I think that uh, being involved in this energy transition and understanding um, the various positions of the different uh, energy uh, bearers, uh, PVs, um, solar, um, wind, um, hydropower, oil, gas, coal, nuclear. I, I think that is um, that would that would add another uh, uh, leg to stand on uh, when you when you come into the the, the industry. Okay, we have a, another question. Um, 
Given the support of the Norwegian government for uh, oil and gas production and exploration, um, do you think that uh, what you were able um, and your team were able to pull off uh, could have happened in any other uh, country? Yeah, we did not have any special tax incentive or anything like that when we did this work. I mean, we were finished prior to knowing about this and all the budgets were approved and everything. So, so that had no, nothing to do with, with our survey as such. And um, I don't, I mean, if you look at the UK sector, if this survey happened to be in the UK, I don't see that that would make any difference whatsoever. Um, I think one of the tape batches went off in Aberdeen and the other in Stavanger and the processing was in the UK. And uh, yeah, so I, I don't think that would have mattered any for any specific um, reason. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions from the audience? Oh, I don't see any. All right. Any last questions from uh, Aurelian or Adriana? Okay. All right. Well, with that, I'd like to uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Pierre Evin, um, for a very interesting presentation, lots of information. Um, and thank you all for attending the SEG Europe Regional Advisory Committee's webinar as part of our webinar series, State of the Energy Industry. Please look for our social media posts uh, to register for upcoming uh, webinars. Uh, thank you again for attending today. And thank you again, uh, Piravind, uh, for a very nice presentation. Uh, I hope uh, everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.